I'm 40 years old and I've been exercising regularly for over 10 years and I sometimes wonder how fit am I? But is that the right question to ask or should I be asking how healthy am I? Does fitness equals health? In this video, I'm gonna do various fitness tests to see how fit and healthy I am. <laughs> I'll also be comparing the results from the tests to the numbers on my fitness watch to see how accurate they are. And from all this, I'm hoping to share some tips and advice on what we can all do to live a healthy and cheerful life without you having to do all this yourself. I visited the Human Performance Institute at Surrey University with my mate Sarah to have a VO2 max test, lactic threshold, an ECG to test my heart, spirometry to test my lungs, body composition measurements, skin fold test to measure my body fat, and a resting metabolic rate test. And I'll explain each one in detail as we go along. To begin, I had my weight and my height measured, and then the first test was the resting metabolic rate test. This works out the amount of calories my body burns in a rested state. This 20 minute test measures the amount of oxygen my body uses and how much carbon dioxide it produces. And then the machine uses that data to work out how many calories my body needs per 24 hours. This is a popular test in the lab by all sorts of people because it gives an accurate amount of calories needed by the individual, which can then help with weight loss, weight gain and weight management. And as I wait for these results, now would be a good time for me to explain why I've booked all these tests. As I get older, my body is changing, which is inevitable. My body composition scales that I use at home tells me that my muscle and bone mass are decreasing, which isn't great in terms of long-term health. I'm not as strong or as fit as I used to be, even just a couple of years ago. Perhaps that's because I've had COVID twice. Maybe because I intentionally put on 10 kilograms for a challenge last year and stopped doing as much exercise. Or maybe it's just because I'm getting older. Whatever the reason, I want to be fit and healthy and I'm hoping that these tests will give me an understanding of how to maintain, or even better, improve my fitness. My result for the resting metabolic rate test was 1,363 calories, which means I need that many calories each day just for my body to do its basic functions without moving. And this is almost the same figure that my Tanita body composition scales that I use at home gives, which is reassuring. That was really relaxing. Next up is measuring my body composition on this machine. This will measure my body weight, BMI, body fat, muscle mass, visceral fat, which is the fat that's around my organs, body water, cell health, and again, resting metabolic rate. I usually measure myself on these scales, which for a home scale are quite pricey at 459 pound. But this machine cost 9,000 pounds and it was gonna be way more accurate. Stepping on with bare feet and holding the handles, the machine sends a tiny electrical impulse through the body, which can't be felt at all. The test takes about 30 seconds, and then I'm given a printout with in-depth stats and descriptions. And the results tell me that I'm a normal weight for my height. I've got a normal amount of body fat, although if I'm not careful, it could move into the overweight area. My fat-free mass, which is my bones, muscles, and connective tissue is low, probably too low. The visceral fat around my organs is normal. My skeletal muscle is okay, but could be better. Body water is okay, but could be better. And my cell health is good. These figures are somewhat reassuring, but there's definitely some stuff that could be improved. And it was this result that was a massive wake up call for me. It showed that my body was edging towards being skinny fat. And if you're unfamiliar with skinny fat, the proper name is sarcopenia. It means having a high percent of body fat and a low muscle mass, even though from the outside the body may look like a healthy weight and being skinny fat is not ideal for long-term health. And at this point, it's important for me to say that by doing all of these tests, this isn't about the way that I look or even about the way that I perform. This is about my long-term health. So from all of these results, one thing that has jumped to the top of my priority list is increasing my muscle mass. And this will improve my bone density, which will help prevent things like osteoporosis and help prevent metabolic diseases. I'm making a separate video about me doing some strength tests and we'll explain more details in that video, so keep an eye out for that on my channel. While on the topic of body composition, the next test is the skin fold test. Not something that I was looking forward to as it means pinching my fat between this device. Jan, who was the sports science intern, precisely marked nine parts of my body 
and then Dr. David King, the lab manager, measured those areas with the calipers to see how much fat was under the skin. And when performed correctly, this test is highly accurate and reliable. And some of the areas were really sensitive. Is that comfortable? No, but it's fine. How's that feel? It's all all right. <laughs> it's all sensitive. <laughs> I also had the circumference of my arm, waist, hips and calf measured along with the bone breadth of my humerus and femur. And the results came out that I was below average for my skin fold tests, which wasn't great. My waist circumference was saying that I had a low risk of metabolic disease and that with a body fat of 31.27%, the other test gave a result of 32.7%, this is classed as overweight. And I'll be honest, I never considered myself overweight but then again, I did gain lots of weight for a challenge last year and I'm struggling to get the last four kilos off. And although to some people, I may not look as though I fit into the overweight category, doing these tests and getting these stats is a good indicator of what I need to do to stay on top of things. And doing all of this worked really well with some recent blood tests that I had, measuring vitamins, minerals, hormones, gut health, organ health, so much stuff. And it showed some really surprising results. And all these videos are part of a series investigating my fitness, strength, health and brain health. And my goal with this series is to share my experience and results, along with tips for us all to live a long, healthy and cheerful life. So if you're into stuff like that, watch out for them on my channel. Next up was the ECG, an electrocardiogram, which is used to check the rhythm and activity of my heart and can be used to diagnose heart abnormalities. Electrodes were placed on my body and I lay there for about 10 minutes while the machine did its thing. What I'm going to do is just kind of watch this, um, make sure it's regular. Now you can see every little spike there in regards to all of these complexes. That's the ventricles to polarising. Um, so that's basically every heartbeat and the space in between where it goes back to the isoelectric line. That is like the heart filling and getting ready to pump again. But what I'm just going to make sure is that this is a nice regular pattern and then we're going to look at the complexes involved and make sure that there's no underlying you know, disorders there that could indicate maybe an abnormal size of the heart, mm. could indicate that the heart doesn't um, receive enough blood back to itself, which could be an indicator of like cardiovascular disease mm. and, a f and a few other things like whether or not the, the, the right areas of the heart that polarise in the right order and things like that as well and I was told that my heart was healthy. Apparently, possible normal ECG is a good thing as it never says just normal. And I got a print out of my heartbeats, which was really cool. So clever, isn't it? So, like, it, just who even invents these things? <laughs> the final test before the ones that I was absolutely dreading was the spirometry. Spirometry. How to say spiro... Spirometry. 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 The final test was the spirometry, a blowing contraption which measures lung function, the capacity of the lungs and the force that air can be expelled. And this can help diagnose lung conditions. I've never had this before, so I was keen to see how I'd do. First, I had to put on a nose clip, so all the breathing I was doing was through my mouth. The test involved three rounds and using this fancy device, I'd breathe normally for three breaths and then when instructed, take a full inhale and then a hard, fast, forceful exhale, exhaling until I was told to stop when my lungs were totally empty. Here's me breathing normally big breath in. and then the charts show my big inhale and, out. and exhale. Big breath in. And out. There you go. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And breathe normally for me. Breathe normally. Doing all of these tests got me thinking. This was like having a health check, an MOT to see that my body is working okay, which after being on the planet for 40 years, I've never done. So I'm feeling like this was a good thing. Plus I like stuff like this. I'll give you all of the details and the prices of the tests later on. The results of my spirometry came out as healthy, saying that there was no underlying obstructive or restrictive pulmonary conditions present. And now we've saved the best till last, the tests that I was dreading the most, 
the lactic threshold and VO2 max tests. These will both work me to my limit, which I wasn't particularly looking forward to. Come on. These tests can be done on a treadmill or an exercise bike, but I'm doing mine on a treadmill as I run regularly. Starting with the lactate threshold test, I had my blood taken at the start with a small finger prick to measure my resting lactate levels. The lactic threshold test will measure the point at which my body starts producing lactate faster than it can be cleared. Lactate or lactic acid is a byproduct of the energy production process and during high intensity exercise, the body will produce lactate as a source of energy. And the lactic threshold test works like this. It's four minute blocks of exercise, starting at a steady pace. Throughout each block, I rate my effort level between six to 19. Where you feel you're working? Seven. Seven? Perfect. At the end of each four minute block, I have my blood retested for lactate. The intensity of exercise then increases. Where you feel you're working? Thirteen. Thirteen. Perfect. Just ask what I'll ask you again. Seventeen. Seventeen. Perfect. Keep going. Wow. Raise the pocket hand up for me, please. The test stops when my body is producing more lactate than it can clear. Right, yeah, straddle, look my way. We just hold on to that. Give you a fresh air there, that's more important. Right. <sighs> Didn't expect that one to be so hard. The test can be a good indicator of fitness level and also to help personalise training plans. It's useful for me because it will work out my heart rate training zones for my runs, which I can customise onto my watch rather than using the estimated presets. The results of my lactic threshold test shows that the maximum speed I can run where I'm right on the threshold of the lactate being cleared is 10.3 kilometres an hour, which is the same as five 50 minute kilometres or a heart rate of 162 beats per minute. And this makes sense, seeing as my hard effort 5K run right now is around 29 minutes. The test also gave details on speeds at which my body burns fat and carbohydrates and also shows my running efficiency. A lot of information for a 20 minute test. And with all this data, I was given my personalized heart rate training zones to get the best out of my training. And I entered these numbers straight into my fitness watch. So how do the numbers compare to the lactic threshold on my Garmin watch? The last test I did several weeks ago predicted my lactic threshold at 5.43 minute kilometres and a heart rate of 160 beats per minute, which is really accurate. I had a 30 minute break between the tests and I knew this was going to be the worst. The VO2 max test was going to be tough and the anticipation was already getting to me. My heart rate is so high already, I feel. It is actually, it's 121. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, 119. Typical me. VO2 max stands for volume, oxygen, maximum. The maximum amount of oxygen the body can take in and use to power the cells during exercise. Starting at a steady pace, the speed increases every minute until I can't run anymore. Got a number on your RPE scale, please. 13. 13, thank you. It was a maximum effort test running to exhaustion. Come on, LT, stay with it. I swear it's gonna get harder now. Hence the harness. It's there in case someone pushes so hard they collapse. A VO2 max test is a good indicator of overall aerobic fitness. The more oxygen the body can take in and use, the more work it can do. Come on. Keep going. In my 30s, I used to exercise in a really high heart rate, and even though it hurt, I was used to it. But these days, I don't do it. And I'd give you a reason why, but the honest answer is, I can't be bothered, because it doesn't feel nice. <laughs> it's so... Get the, uh, face out. So now the test is over, let's compare the results to my Garmin watch. My watch tells me that I have a VO2 max score of 45. This time last year it was 49, but again, my fitness and maybe my health has taken a steep decline recently. 
This test gave me a VO2 max score of 35.45. 10 points difference is quite a lot. And the fitness test I've just done is gonna be as close to accurate as it can be. However, it's worth noting a few things. I hadn't been feeling great for a week prior to the test. My heart rate variability had been low for some time and I hadn't eaten yet that day. I also didn't push to my absolute exhaustion point. I didn't really fancy hanging off that harness. How are you feeling? Right, I didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> but I did work hard and I was really tired from the day. This test was only going to keep getting harder and harder. You kind of think you've got more, but then you're in so much pain, it's only going to get worse. And as Mark Lewis explains... The second you stop, is a weird bit in your brain where it thinks, oh, I could have gone on a couple of seconds more. But it's all slightly academic because you've gone past that point where your body is no longer operating with sufficient oxygen. So you might as well be just holding your breath for all it's doing in terms of improving the test results. So I don't know if any of these things would have made a difference. I may have got an extra point, but nothing major. So my guess is my Garmin watch is using my previous running times and my previous fitness to predict my VO2 max. And from what I've seen in other people's videos is the VO2 max predictor on the Garmin watches is often accurate within about two or three points. So I think that my case is an exception. The result of 35.45 puts me just in the excellent category for a woman of my age, which as you can imagine, makes me very happy. So what's my plan with all of this and what advice can I pass on to you? What I've learned from all of this is that I'm a little bit overweight. I'd benefit from losing some body fat I have a healthy heart, lungs and cells. My cardiovascular fitness is excellent, but I could do with increasing quite a bit of muscle. And the getting more muscle part has been a massive wake up call for me because I didn't really realize it was so low, but I kind of did. I just thought that running and yoga was doing the trick, but it doesn't seem like they were. If you cannot or do not want to do tests like I did, fitness watches seem to be a good option for measuring cardiovascular fitness. And for measuring VO2 max with no equipment, there's something called the Cooper test, which I might make a video about. But the main message here is to exercise, both cardio and strength. The more I read and listen to experts in the field of health, the more I realise that lifting weight is essential for our long-term health. Increasing muscle mass and bone density, burning body fat, as well as improving mobility, sleep, and it's excellent for injury prevention. It's a total winner. Strength training or weight training isn't just for men or for younger people, it's for everyone. In fact, even more important for someone over the age of 30 because each year that passes, the body loses muscle. And it's even more important for women because bone density decreases after the menopause, which can lead to osteoporosis. So the winning combination is to combine strength training with interval training. I'm now doing these two things despite not really liking them. And it all sounds like a lot of effort, I know, but a strong and healthy body will take care of us through our life and help prevent disease. And that's what we all want, right? I'm going to spend the next year working on some important things and come back in 12 months and retest all of these things to see what difference I can make. If you're interested in the tests that I had, the prices are on screen and I linked David's lab in the description. There was a lot of information in this video, so drop any questions or any thoughts that you've got about any of this in the comments. And hopefully I'll see you at my next video about my blood tests, where I've got some fascinating stuff to share with you guys.